you have an insert it's got a lot of words in it we're not going to read all his words amen, amen. <laughs> There it is. So, um, but I am keeping Randy afterwards, and we're going to spend some time one on one. <laughs> Amen. Amen. So, I also just want to uh, acknowledge it's good to see uh, Kevin and his family with us in worship again today. Years ago, I read. Uh, from Charles Spurgeon. In fact, I was 18 years old when I started reading Charles Spurgeon. Uh, at Tennessee Temple University in Chattanooga, uh, at least one good thing, the library on campus had all the works of Charles Spurgeon. And I'm not exaggerating. All his books that he wrote, all of his sermons, his sermons are bound in what's called the Metropolitan Tabernacle, and that's that's the name of that was the name of the church that Charles Spurgeon pastored in the late 1800s in downtown England. And uh, I became a uh, just a, a lover of this man. He became a hero of the faith for me. And uh, I would read his Christmas sermons, and I would read all kinds of sermons, the Treasury of David section. A few years ago. This book was put out by Elizabeth Ruth Scovland. She titled her book, Bright Days and Dark Nights with Charles Spurgeon, colon, In Triumph Over Emotional Pain. A lot of people don't know, but they do because of this book, but most people don't sit around and read lots and lots and lots and lots and lots of sermons of Charles Spurgeon, but a lot of people did not know and still do not know that on average, Charles Spurgeon, every single year of his life in pastoring that church of 5,000 to 10,000 people every Sunday in the late 1800s, no microphone, no electricity, he would speak to over 5,000 people every single week, started an orphanage, started a preacher's school, missionary work. He is the most famous, most successful evangelist pastor that this world has ever known outside of the Apostle Paul. But most people do not know that every single year, everywhere from two to three months, he took time off to deal with his depression. Clearly, if he were living today, any reputable psychologist psychiatrist would advise medicine for Charles Spurgeon and he would be clinically declared clinically depressed any diagnosis of today well Elizabeth did us a great favor by reading everything about Spurgeon that he wrote and put together a book a small paperback on this subject Charles Spurgeon said, and she titles this section of her book, Depression is Not a Sin. Charles Spurgeon said, Fits of depression come over the most of us. Usually cheerful as we may be, we must at intervals be cast down. The strong are not always vigorous, the wise are not always ready, the brave not always courageous, and the joyous not always happy. Knowing by most painful experience what deep depression of spirit means, see he's making this personal, being visited therewith at seasons by no means few or far between, I thought it might be consolatory, a consolation, to some of my brethren if I gave my thoughts thereon that younger men might not fancy that some strange thing had happened to them when they became for a season possessed by melancholy, and that sadder men might know that one upon whom the sun had shone right joyously did not always walk in the light. I'm not going to read all these. But I've got you to 10 after 12. There's a category that Elizabeth has in her book where she pulls together his other quotes. Depression is the path to heaven for some. Spiritual darkness of any sort is to be avoided and not desired, and yet, surprising as it may seem to be, 
It is a fact that some of the best of God's people frequently walk in darkness. Some of them are wrapped in a sevenfold gloom at times, and to them neither sun nor moon nor stars appear. As the pastor of a large church, I have to observe a great variety of experiences, and I note that some whom I greatly love and esteem, who are, in my judgment, among the very choicest of God's people, nevertheless travel most of the way to heaven by night. That is a great, great way of expressing it. I won't finish that paragraph. Travel most of the way to heaven by night. On the next one, great quote on depression and guilt. I just love the very last line. It is possible at such times even to question the existence of the God we love, though we still cling to him with desperate resolve. And he did. This is a great quote right here on the issue of guilt. Do you love me? Why have you laid such a heavy hand on me? And yet, I am resolved to hang on to you. Spurgeon lived his life like this. Next subject, depression is real. Spurgeon says, how long the spirits of good and brave men will sometimes sink. Under the influence of certain disorders, everything will wear a somber aspect and the heart will dive into the profoundest days of misery. It is all very well for those who are in robust health and full of spirits to blame those whose lives are covered over with melancholy. But the pain is as real as a gaping wound and all the more hard to bear because it lies so much in the region of the soul that to the inexperienced it appears to be a mere matter of fancy and imagination. And he's right, and I too thought the same way about depression. Because quite honestly, I have a very optimistic personality. The Lord gave it to me. I, I'm upbeat most of the time and Life's good. It's hard, yeah, but we'll get through it. You know, attitude. My mom and dad have always been like this. I grew up in a home where there was unbelievable reasons to just, you know, just go do yourself in. <laughs> All the cancer and the doctors and the disappointments and everything. And yet my mom and dad, I, grew, I just grew up in a home with a very optimistic, yes, attitude of life. And I too have been guilty of thinking Ah, it's just your imagination. Get over it. Buck up. <laughs> Reader, never ridicule the nervous and the hypochondriacal. I don't even, I can't even say that. I'm from West Virginia. I can't. Their pain is real. Their pain is real. It is not imaginary. The mind can descend far lower than the body. Flesh can bear only a certain number of wounds and no more. But the soul can bleed in 10,000 ways and die over and over again each hour. No one can write like this except Spurgeon. It is grievous to the good man to see the Lord whom he loves laying him in the sepulcher of desponding. Yet if faith could be but be allowed to speak, she would remind the depressed saint that it is better to fall into the hand of the Lord than into the hands of men. And moreover, she would tell the despondent heart that God never placed Joseph in a pit without drawing him up again to fill a throne. Alas, when under deep depression the mind forgets all this and his only conscience of its unutterable misery, it is an unspeakable consolation that our Lord Jesus knows this experience right well, having with the exception of the sin of it, felt it all and more than all in Gethsemane when he was exceedingly sorrowful even unto death. A brief paragraph, depression is for my good. I just want to read the front end of it. Depression comes over me whenever the Lord is preparing a larger blessing for my ministry. It has now become to me a prophet in rough clothing. <laughs> Whew. 
Next subject. Depression is not greater than God. I just want to read the top paragraph. I had been in a madhouse a dozen times if it had not been for my God. My feet had altogether gone into the chambers of despair, and I had ended this life, yes, suicidal, if it had not been for the faithful promises of the God that keeps and preserves his people. And then you need to read those other two long paragraphs later. You know, with um, Isaiah chapter 9, verse 2, and the fulfillment looking to Jesus in Luke chapter 1, you've got Elijah, so sorrowful, so depressed, he just wants to die. He just wants to sit in a cave and die. John the Baptist is locked up in prison. And after heralding, behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, John the Baptist sends his own disciples to go to ask Jesus are, are, you, are you the Messiah? Did you get that? <laughs> are you the Messiah? Behold the Lamb of God who takes the sin of the world and then John the Baptist speaks out against Herod's adultery and then he ends up in prison and they're going to put his, literally put his head on a platter and he wonders if Jesus is the Messiah. I think John the Baptist just wept and wept and wept. This strong, rugged, bearded, locust-eating, honey-dripping-off-the-beard man, I think he just wept. Five things for us this morning. Since Scripture focuses on the hope of light, it's in the Old Testament, Isaiah 9, 2, it's fulfilled in Jesus. Jesus is the light of the world. Jesus spoke often about that and used that metaphor to describe who he is. I am the light of the world in John's gospel over and over and over. Since scripture focuses on the hope of light, then the abnormality of darkness is a normal state for mankind. Let me explain. The abnormality of darkness. True. This sadness and these reasons for sadness, they're not right. They're not supposed to be here. And it goes all the way back to the fall. And it is an abnormality. But yet at the same time, because of the fall, sadness is a natural and normal consequence of living in a broken body, a broken mind, a broken world. And it really is the pretender who is buying or entertaining their way through this life in order to not to come to terms with why am I so sad? And a lot of people do. They will buy their way. They will entertain their way out of darkness. That's how they def- get their hope back. Scripture doesn't have an answer like that. Scripture points to the light, Christ. But I say this issue on point number one those who have a melancholy spirit are not freaks of nature they're not in fact it's quite normal to be sad in a broken world secondly since scripture does not silence the pain of darkness Psalm 88 especially since scripture does not silence the pain of darkness of gloom but rather acknowledges it, then we too can be honest about our fears and what makes us feel sad and depressed and all without guilt, and I would say without guilt and shame. At least before the Lord and maybe in front of a few close friends. And especially here at Grace Community Church, no need for guilt and shame. There is room there is safety for expressing pain and darkness. Thirdly, since scripture spreads the gloom of darkness over all the earth, and that's what Isaiah 9's prophecy is about, because the gloom of darkness is over all the earth. Hence, verse 6, the need for a son to be given. Hence, the need for a child to grow up and become this son to be given to us. And the government on his shoulder. And he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Oh, finally. 
Jesus. Yeah. So since scripture spreads the gloom of darkness over all the earth, then you are not alone, though at times you're not alone. The whole earth is in gloom of darkness. Jesus didn't come to is- for Israel only. He came for everyone. But though at times you may want to be alone in your pain, that too is okay. So read it fully. Since Scripture spreads the gloom of darkness over all the earth, then you're not alone. That's good news. Though at times you may want to be alone in your pain, and that too is okay if. Number four, you keep your eyes on the light. Who is Jesus? Because that is the way we deal with our pain. We don't want to be around people and it's okay to be alone and be quiet and be alone with the Lord. In fact, Jesus teaches us to go into your, from the Father, go into your closet alone with the Lord, alone with the Lord. And when you read the Psalms, David was alone, him and the Lord, crying out to the Lord. And it's okay as long as you keep your eyes on the light, Jesus. I love John chapter 1, verse 1. We quoted it last Sunday. In the beginning was the Word, and we quoted it in Wednesday apologetics. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And then John talks about Jesus is the light. And then verse 14, we beheld his glory. Yes, the light. I see the light. There it is. It's Christ. Christ is the answer to all of my fears, my sadness, my depression. No longer hope deferred. I do get real hope in Christ and one day fully. So keep your eyes on the light. Fifthly and last, sadness and depression may never fully go away. And it didn't for Charles Spurgeon. It didn't for William Cooper. It doesn't. For most people, it doesn't really totally go away. And the reason why is because I still live in this broken body. I still live in this broken world. I still live with a broken mind. Tainted by sin. Not that sadness and depression is sin, but that because sin is real and sin is here, then we have real reasons to be sad and sorrowful. So sadness and depression may never fully go away until Jesus returns to get you. That too is okay, provided you do number four. (laughs) Keep your eyes on Christ, your real hope, your real light. To see Jesus as the light is the grace that sustains you. And that is the grace. If you see Jesus, then you are under his grace. So for your joy, there is grace for those who are sad and depressed and melancholy. And if you see Jesus, then, then you know that that is its grace. You see him. You're not still wandering in the darkness. Singing along with Taylor Swift. Last Christmas I gave you my heart. And the very next day you threw it away. I know it's, we, can, we can rag on Taylor Swift. But she really did get her heart broken. And she really is a human being. Made in the image of God. And if she doesn't find Jesus. She's going to get her heart broken over and over and over and over and over and over again. And maybe she'll be able to buy her way and fame her way through the sadness. Possibly. But she still has a heart that got broken. And they're the only answer for Taylor Swift, for you, for me, and for anyone else. Or if Mariah Carey sings it. She does a pretty good job with that song too. The real answer is Christ. It always has been and always will. And if you see Christ, if you know that Christ is your hope, he's the real light, you've been blessed. You've been blessed. There's grace all over you. And that's good news. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you for your mercies upon each and every one of us. I'm thankful that you have promised through David, the psalmist, that you hold, the songwriters didn't make, the secular songwriters didn't make this up, you hold, this is a real psalm, you hold 
every tear in a bottle stored up, meaning you know every single reason that has caused a tear to fall down our face. And you have not forgotten, and one day it will be resolved in you. And we thank you for that, Lord. That's real hope. That's, that's real hope. And you sent your son to confirm it. And we thank you, Lord. So be our hope, be our light, as you have promised to be so. Help us to live our lives in such a way this Christmas season that we might be able to, in word and in deed, show others that there is a real hope. And whatever hope that has been deferred, they can look to Christ. So, Lord, thank you for this day, and we pray these things in your name.